May I have your attention, please? So I show them everyone. I'm the Sylvia Shrohebo, Deacon Justin Hawkins. I'd like to serve you forever as a priest time very soon. It's, it's now time to start finding your seats for self service. Shabbat shalom, everyone. My name is Son of Your Joy, but Buffalo Bill Hawkins, and I'd like to serve you as a free starting very soon. It's a privilege and honor to present to you the sons and daughters of your label now entering the sanctuary. I now present one of the sons of your label, Yeshia Hawkins. Shabbat shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. The title of my speech today is A Right to Choose. Today we are going to review a, a few things our great teacher, Yusha Hawkins, has brought, us, brought to us over the last couple of weeks. Do you remember when Pastor said, Yahweh is not weak like Satan. He's allowing her and her agency to go their own way for a set time. Remember, Yahweh is in full control. This set time for Satan is almost up. Yahweh's perfect plan, as it says in Yachanan 1, 1 through 5, is going to be complete. Please turn there with me. Yachanan 1, 1 through 5, on page 814. Yachanan 1, 1 through 5. It says, In the beginning was the plan of Yahweh, and the plan was with Yahweh, and the plan was Yahweh's. The same plan was in the beginning with Yahweh. All things were done according to it, and without it nothing was done that was done. In this plan was life, and the life was the light to mankind. Now that light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not take hold of it. Pastor told us, Yahweh knew this agency would be the lawgiver in the last days. He prophesied it in Genesis 49.10, for your notes, and he also gave, a, to, gave Daniel a prophecy that the same group would take away the daily reading of the law. Turn with me to Daniel 11.31. Daniel 11.31 on page 683. Daniel eleven thirty one. And the army will stand and the army will stand on his part, and they will pollute the sanctuary of strength, and will take away the daily sacrifice, and and they will place the Lord of heaven. So they would take away the daily reading of the law, which they did. They stopped teaching Yahweh's laws, and even took away the book of Yahweh. But remember, Yahweh allowed all of this. He gave Satan authority to do whatever she wanted to do. Pastor told us last week that he believed in human rights. He said everyone should have the right to choose, righteousness or evil. But the Catholic Church took that right to choose away from the people. They took the ability to learn the laws of Yahweh away from the people. But, but once again, Yahweh has a plan to counteract Satan. He planned for his servant, the chosen branch, to be born in the last days, who would bring back the right to choose by establishing Yahweh's house and bringing back the book of Yahweh. Remember, the book of Yahweh is back and it's here to stay. Please turn over in your book's eye to Zechariah 6, 12 through 13. Zechariah 6, 12 through 13 on page 719. Zechariah 6, 12 through 13. 
speak to him and say, This is what Yahweh of hosts says, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he will branch out from his place, and he will build the house of Yahweh. Yes, he will build the house of Yahweh. He will bear glory. He will sit and rule on his throne. He will be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace will be between them both. As we know, the council of peace is between Yishal Hawkins and Yahshua, our high priest. Praise Yahweh. Two weeks ago, Pastor ended his sermon by saying, You'll be so joyous you started with Isaiah 58 and ended with Malachi 4. Let's turn to Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. On page... 567, Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. It says, If you turn away your foot from breaking the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure business, your own pleasure, on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of Yahweh honorable, and and will honor him by not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor engaging in idle conversation, then you will find your joy in Yahweh, and I will cause you to ride on the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Yaakov, your father, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken it. So if we keep our weekly Sabbath appointments with Yahweh, we are getting the knowledge to choose right from wrong. Now let's end with Malachi 4. It says, For behold, the day comes that will burn like an oven, and all the proud, yes, and all who do wickedly will be stubble. The day that comes will burn them up, says Yahweh of hosts, and it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you, who reverence my name in the light of righteousness, will arise with healing in its wings. You will go out leaping like calves released from the stalls. Here we can clearly see two distinct groups of people. One who is classified as wicked, and the other who chooses to practice righteousness. Those who practice righteousness will be protected from this great burning that is going to take place very soon. As Pastor said, we will be so joyous that we kept the Sabbath day and had the mark of Yahweh upon us. And with that, if everyone stays standing, we'll turn it over to the great Deacon Samuel Hawkins. Praise Yahweh. You may all be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. It truly is a great honor to come before the called out ones here today. And uh, today I have a uh, very important message, very serious message, and I do hope that everyone do pay attention. If everyone can see that right there, everyone see that? Praise Yahweh. That's the what I'm going to be talking about today is being serious-minded in all our vows to Yahweh. And it's very important that we truly understand what our vows are to Yahweh, and to keep those, keep those vows. To quickly define what a vow is, do you see that right there? A vow means a promise. A promise or pledge binding oneself to an act a way of life. And this is from the Webster's Dictionary. And also the word serious. You can get it right there. Serious, the definition for serious means earnest, zealous, and sincere. But notice here, not joking or trifling. In other words, you know, taking it lightly. 
requiring careful consideration, giving cause for concern. And I truly do hope everyone uh, go over those definitions because the vows that we make to Father Yahweh are not idle. They're not something we just say and has no value in it. But before we make any vows, we must be serious-minded. What we say, we must keep. If you have your book of Yahweh, if you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and verse 2, found on page 520. And this is talking about paying your vows, paying your vows to Yahweh. If you look at verse 2, it says, Do not be rash, reckless with your mouth. Do not think of hastily uttering a word before Yahweh. Yahweh is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. Let's jump to verse 4. When you make a vow to Yahweh, do not delay to pay it. Don't delay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed to pay. And also look at verse 5. It is better that you should not vow in the first place than to vow something and not pay it. This is how serious it is. And, you know, pastor has a lot to say about the, these vows that we make to Father Yahweh. You know, of course, without pastor, we will know nothing. We will know nothing. But it's with pastor that we have this understanding and this wisdom that he brings forth each and every Sabbath. And, and it gives us that understanding so that we can fulfill the law of Yahweh. Now, if you look here, and I kind of, I really wanted everyone to, to read along with me as we go through uh, a few of these here uh, from the uh, books of Israel. But this is the first, the first book of Israel, chapter uh, 28, verse 6. And then the pastor here says, keep your mind on the go and on the original vows that you made. Those vows are right. You need to uphold them and keep your mind on them. You will have a place in the kingdom if you do it. It will not be easy for Satan and the demons around you to influence you if you do, if you do not do this. So notice here that it's, it's Satan, you know, her demons wanting to influence us to not keep Yahweh's laws, but also not to uphold our vows. You know, of course, Satan is, is always against Yahweh's house and, his, and, and uh, Yahweh's people, but we have to do our part. We have to do our part in, in keeping the laws and keeping our vows that we have made. You know, because once we've forgotten our, our vows, you know, that's the opportunity that, that Satan seeks for. Seeks for to influence, to break these vows that we have made to Yahweh. If you uh, turn over to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 23, uh, final page 166, and if you look at verse 21, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21, and we'll go through 23, final page 166. Starting at verse 21, it says, If you make a vow to Yahweh, you must, you must not delay to pay it. For Yahweh your father will certainly demand it to you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from even making the vow in the first place, you will not be sinning. Verse 23, whatever goes out of your mouth, you must be sure to do, because you made your vow freely of your own free will, to Yahweh your father with your own mouth. And to to better understand this scripture here, 
of course, our high priest, Yeshua Messiah, spoke more about this uh, and expounded more on this, you know, really making it very easy to understand, even for a child to understand, of how important uh, the vows to Yahweh are. If you turn to Matthew chapter 50, uh, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Uh, this is found on page 731. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. It says, Again, you have heard that it was said by the people of ancient times when a man vows a vow to Yahweh or vows an oath to bind himself to some pledge, he shall not break his word. He must do everything he uh, said he would do. And go to verse 37. And this is the part that, that Yeshua really explained it very easily for even a child can understand. If you look at verse 37, but vow your vow, then let your yes be yes. Or simply do not vow, and let your no be no. Anything more than this, than this is from the evil one. And uh, notice there, uh, Yeshua didn't say, you know, let your yes be maybe. Or let your maybe be maybe, or no be maybe, right? But let your yes be yes, and your no be no. And and and, and in this, just you know, those who have uh, been studying the peace of solution, you can clearly see there that Yahshua was teaching us to be decisive, to make up our mind on what we wanted to do, to keep our word. You know, not to to beat around the bush, you know, because remember, vows are very serious. And one, one thing I wanted to point out, you know, also with the vows here, was that once you make a vow, you can't go back on it, brothers and sisters. Once you've made a vow, you have made that vow. And like the scriptures that we've already covered, do not delay to pay it. It's forever. You know, just as Yahweh is forever, so is our vows. Praise Yahweh. But to further go in here, you know, Pastor gave some really great examples in the books of Israel, you know, more particularly to a certain type of vow, but our marriage vows. Our marriage vows. In the third book of Israel, chapter 10, verse 77, Pastor reads here, uh, actually, in verse 76, let's start at verse 76 here. It says, the next definition we see in the word sanctified is to pronounce. The word pronounce means to pronounce, to, de to, to declare officially. In your case, it will be to declare it officially before Yahweh because it must be established with words. Verse, 70, verse 77 here says, if you think about this, uh, think about a marriage. This is the same thing that takes place in a marriage. What took place in your marriage? You announced it officially. This man is the husband of this wife. This wife belongs to this man. You announced it in front of witnesses. It was a public announcement. And the pastor has more to say about it in the next here, next part, in a different book. The first book of Israel, chapter 22, and verse 98. Uh, but remember, we're talking about seriousness, the, the vows that, we, that we've made to Yahweh. Uh, verse 98 is probably about the third sentence or second sentence in that, that, uh, that verse there. But it says, what do you come together for, a, for at a wedding? Is it chills and thrills? Drinking wine and eating things? No. It is to get two people together in front of Yahweh and to actually witness that these two people are getting married under his supervision. By his laws. You are asking Yahweh to put these two people together in a holy marriage. That will last forever. It will not be temporary. That is what you are doing. 
uh, this is what you should be hoping to do. It is not for a party. Uh, you can have your <laughs> damn parties at your home by yourself if you want to with your family. But when you come here, it should be in worship of Yahweh. Worship of Yahweh is having Yahweh involved in this stuff. This is back to basics. Now, this is what pastor is talking about, the seriousness. This is back to basics. This is back to this holiness. Back to keeping the laws of Yahweh. Um, praise Yahweh. It, because we're, we were of this world, you know, we have this worldly influence still in us that, of course, all of us are still overcoming and we're still striving to, to get rid of. But just to give you an idea, you know, I want to talk about the marriages and vows in this world. It says marriage. I want to talk about how the marriage is, is like a show in Hollywood. You know, it's like a show in Hollywood, and that's how they portray it. You know, there's this glitz and glamour and all this festivities. You know, but of course, like we read, you know, it's, it's private between a man and a woman and Yahweh. Uh, but I wanted to, to let you see something here. And this is from thecostofweddings.com. Um, the average wedding cost in the United States is, and of course, there's five digits there, just to give you an idea how much it costs. Um, <laughs> but it actually costs, this is the average amount of, of a wedding in America. That's the average amount, All right? Okay, and this is from the course cost of wedding. This is what they this is what they're wanting you to do. You know, to forget your vows and get caught up into this glitz and glamour, not taking your vows seriously, and just to kind of really get into perspective for you young ones, what I'm talking about here about this, you know, the average cost, how much twenty six thousand four hundred forty four dollars is. Uh, you know, I looked up here. Uh, average a can of corn is average about sixty six cents. So let's divide that twenty six thousand four hundred forty four dollars into well, that's actually supposed to be a decimal, not a comma. But uh, how many cans of corn is that? Well, it's about let's see if we can get this right forty thousand. And 66 cans of corn. So is that a lot of corn? That's a lot of corn. But this is what, this is what they're spending on in marriages. Uh, I have an article here. It's from, it says, it's from the uh, website called CheatSheet.com. And this is from May 18, 2015, so not long not too long ago, but I just want to read a little, um, little quote here. But it's talking about the marriage statistics, and it says, "Are Americans giving up on marriage?" And it says, "In the past few decades, Americans have become a bit cynical." And the word "cynical," I have to look this up, means to bitterly or sneeringly distrustful, uh, contemptuous, or pessimistic. Okay, so this is the idea that Americans have towards, towards the marriage. When it comes to marriage, uh, this country still boasts a high divorce rate. Um, it says it's hovering around 50%. 50% of marriages today end in divorce. So, in other words, Americans, the average American spends $26,444. And fifty percent of those marriages end in divorce. So this is what this is what we had to. This is what uh, you know, the world has to look forward to. You know, this is more of why we need to be serious minded in all our vows. But this divorce here, of course, you know, there's scriptures talking about this in First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter seven and verse ten, um, found on page eight hundred and ninety one. I'm just read it to you quickly. It says. Now to the married I command not, but Yahweh, a wife, must not separate from her husband. 
And this is what this is what the BC government is is pushing forth. You know, is 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 this is the idea that they have for marriages. And if you are married, they pre, they push for you to get uh, uh, divorced. Um. But this this government, this BC system, system of, uh, government has created what is called a prenuptial agreement. You've ever heard that before. Um, <laughs> but what it is, it's a pre-divorce agreement before you get married. So it's like 50% of marriages, or even 100% of marriages, it could be, before they even get married, they agree on getting divorced. You know, so this, this is the confusion that they have in this world. And of course, you know, I, I kind of read up on it. It's um, you know, stating about how what would occur when, when they get divorced and how both parties must agree upon these terms before even getting married. Um, so you, you, sh- you should clearly see how, how much they, they take seriousness in their vows. They don't. And of course, this has caused a lot of trouble because of, of, of not keeping the, vow, the vows to Yahweh uh, if you turn to Metithia chapter 5, verse 31 through 32, found on page 731. Uh, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Verse 32, however, I say to you that everyone divorcing his wife, except on account of fornication, makes her subject for adultery. Seeing that whoever marries such a divorced woman commits adultery. And of course, this is what the, this is the cause of the rise of STDs, you know, along with other things, of course, but this, this takes a, a big part of it, you know, this div, divorce here. And if you look at Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16, found on page 497, starting on verse 16. It says, discretion and understanding will deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters and sed- with seductive words. In verse 17, who forsakes the companion of her youth, her husband, and notice here, and forgets the covenant of her father Yahweh, her marriage vows. If you look at a uh, side note G, you know, it's talking about the vows to Yahweh of obedience to her head. So it's, it's, it's the forsaking of the vows, not taking it seriously, that is, is, is causing this, this trouble that we see in this world. Um, but I want to look at another article here. It's, it's from relevantmagazine.com. And this is on January 7, 2011. It says, Hollywood's confusing portrayal on marriage. You know, so this, you know, Hollywood is not a place where you should look at to, to pattern your life after. But it says here, new films, new films make, uh, new films make marriage look like a prison. You know, that's a little quote there. And this is what, uh, what they're putting forth out in Hollywood. You know, of course, to, to discredit Yahweh from, from what Yahweh's trying to build, which is, of course, is a family, you know, Hollywood tells you that you can just do whatever you want to do, and it's okay. Another article here from RadicalParenting.com, and this is from 215, 2015 uh, but it was talking about a specific uh, celebrity divorce that occurred at this time. Uh, many of you probably know about it, but it lasted for 72 days. Um, but they were just talking about how celebrity divorces, celebrity divorces and how the media affects teens' views on marriages and divorce. Because remember, the, the, the media today has a strong pull, a strong influence in what children, teenagers, and even adults are patterning their life after in, in, in these time periods. But it says that word forever, um, it has, you know, bolded there. The word forever seems foreign in a world of entertainment. 
You know, because remember, you know, the, the world of entertainment is just to last for a little bit, for a little season, and then just go back to the regular ways that you've been living. Uh, worlds where celebrity marriages last as long as the fashion trends that come with them, it says it's bad enough that 50% of marriages end in divorce. What is this teen supposed to think when, when every magazine, website, entertainment shows latest celebrity news is about celebrity divorce? And this is what they push forth. This is what they show as entertainment to the children of today's society. And of course, you know, like the saying that pastors put into our mind, you know, as California goes, so goes the world. In other words, California, Hollywood, what they put forth, you know, in, in their entertainment industries, it's that standard that they want everyone else to follow to. You know, but this is also occurring, you know, just as we see today as it was occurring in the days of Noah. Uh, you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, found on page 753. Uh, we'll start on verse 37 here. But just as the days of Noah were, so will also be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 38. For just as in those days before the flood, there were eating and drinking, Marrying while giving in marriage until the day that Noah went into the ark, and did not know until the flood came and swept them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man. So notice there, if you look back in verse thirty-eight, that eating and drinking. You know, the eating and drinking are rising up to play. You know, this the, the parties, the banquets that they were having. You know, instead of focusing on the mind on the seriousness of at that time period and. and and keeping Yahweh's laws, they were eating and drinking and rising up to play, like it says in Exodus, Exodus chapter 32, and verse 6. But um, Pastor speaks more about this here. In the first book of Israel, chapter 7, verse 11. This is adultery, divorce, and remarriage. Divorce and remarriage. Yeshua said they are going to be like in the days of Noah. They had the same thing going on then that they have now. They were marrying while they were giving, while they were already given in marriage. Okay, and we have to ask ourselves, why have these, these marriages become like this, to the, the, these, uh, uh, that we see in the world? Now the marriages, the vows, you know, they're not taken seriously. Why? Because they're not based upon Yahweh's laws. They're not based upon Yahweh's laws. In the Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, uh, page 952, let me just read it to you. It says, marriage, verse 4, marriage is totally righteous when it's kept undefiled according to the law, but whoremongers and adulterers, Yahweh will condemn. Yahweh will condemn. And if you look at, well, let me go to... The third book of Israel, chapter 13, verse 9. Let me read this here. It says, Now all of that work hasn't gotten here yet. When we, ordain, when we ordain the elders and the Kohanas into their offices and into the work, they actually have authority to do in the sight of Yahweh, which they will carry into the kingdom. It's nothing more than establishing everything with words just as you would establish a marriage or a betrothal with words, in front of witnesses and in front of Yahweh. What we bound on earth, in heaven, there is no separating it, as they tried to do in the world with this divorce. Now they try to separate it. And of course, the supporting scripture that goes with this, you know, that pastor's talking about here, you look at Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6 here, uh, page 746 it says so are they not according to the law therefore one flesh therefore what Yahweh has joined together let no man put apart you know and, and going back to the marriages that we see on the world you know of course like I said they're not taking it seriously 
these vows that they make. Uh, but they're based on this illegal lust instead of Yahweh's 613 laws. You know, this illegal lust. And there's a section here in the uh, Peaceful Solution Character Education Program, Self-Control Unit, page 33. And it gives us the definition of love. Because the world is pushing forth this false love, but... If you look there, up on top, it says, Love can be one of the most difficult emotions to explain. Many people misunderstand love because of the way it is portrayed in movies, TVs, and romance novels. And, of course, it gives us the, the true definition of love. You see there is highlighted in gray. True love is a bond of mutual trust, interest, and deep care for another. And this is something that they're not teaching in the in the entertainment industry, in the media today. Now, the reason why we should have this true love, you know, reason being is because, you know, again, like they're pushing forth this false love, and they, the world, they, they're, they're making it to where they take the vows very lightly. Remember the definition that we talked about, about seriousness, and, and how we need to take all our vows seriously. But there's a quote that I think everyone should be familiar with. I think we've, we've seen this before. Everyone see that? It says, praise Yahweh. It says, if it's not forever, I don't want it. We shouldn't want it. Yahweh's people should not want these temporary things that they push forth in Hollywood. You know, and, and I asked the Kahan, you know, who, who's been in the house for a long time, and asked him what was the purpose, you know, the meaning behind this quote that they pushed forth at that time. But it was to get into the minds of Yahweh's people that the things in this world are not going to last, and that the things of Yahweh are going to last. Praise Yahweh. So, you know, the vows of Yahweh are not temporary, and just for your notes, you can just write this down. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4 and verse 18 and talks about how uh, the, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But the vows of Yahweh, you know, brothers and sisters, they're, they're not temporary. You can't go back on them. It's forever. And, you know, we have to be serious minded in all these things. And blessed are we if we do keep these. You know, like Pastor mentioned, you know, we will be in the kingdom for keeping these these vows. Don't don't allow anything from this world to influence you to, you know, get you in this, in, in caught up in this glitz and glamour. Uh, you know, it's, it's really going to get your mind off of the seriousness that that we have to have when we do make these vows to Yahweh. So, if y'all please stand. It's a privilege and an honor to present to you Great Kahan Ilya. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may all be seated. Going along with, way, with what the great deacon just brought out about our vows, you know, many people have made one vow to this or one vow to that. Some may be married, some may be not. But we all look forward to a baptism vow. And just to keep in mind, when we make our baptism vows, we we actually set goals. And in the Peaceful Solution, we've talked about that. And we're covering that on the, with the men, and the women are covering it also, about when we take goals seriously, we write them down. And those who write their goals down and, and rehearse them every day will succeed. They're more likely to succeed. And the vow I'm talking about in our baptism vow, we, we say that I vow before Yahweh's priest or priestess that I repent of ever breaking Yahweh's laws and that I will never willingly break any of them again. Now, that's a goal we're setting to never willingly break any of them again, I will diligently strive to convert to keeping and upholding all of Yahweh's law, statutes, uh, ordinances, and judgments as Yahweh commands. So that's a goal that we have, that we set. Many of us may not have read that vow in a while, but we should actually have it written down because that's a goal that we're setting, to keep these vows. And why are these vows so important? Well, in today's news, of course, we're going to look more towards uh, we have thousands, millions of people dying to our left and to our right-hand side. 
Uh, we see the destruction. We see the misery in the Middle East. Pastor brought these things many, many years before they started taking place. They're taking place exactly as Yahweh's house has brought them, exactly as the one sent had said the scriptures prophesied of these things. Yahweh says that he would give his power over to his two witnesses. And then when you know the word power, uh, look at the acceptance unit on page 11. You know that knowledge is power. Yahweh gave his knowledge over to his two witnesses and to the last witness to bring forth what these days would bring. Remember, even either life by righteousness or death by destruction. Now, when we make our vows and agreements, of course, today we're going to see in the news, and it's going to be very graphic. Um, we've shown graphic before, but this will be more graphic than before. If you want to know why we're showing this, we're showing it because when we don't keep our vows, when we break our vows, when we break our agreements, when we sin, we're guilty of all of these things that we see. We can try to justify it, and no, we don't see it in front of us, but it is real. There are children literally blown in half. You will see children blown in half. You will see organs hanging out of bodies. That is what we become. That is what we are a part of when we do not choose this tree of life that we're offered here this day. We have no need to become angry with Yahweh when we see something come upon us because we break our agreements. If we do righteousness, we will be accepted. So please pay attention. Diseases all around us, death and destruction to our left and to our right hand sides. We must take Yahweh's house seriously in everything that it stands for and everything that we vowed we would do. At this time, if we could go ahead and play the news. Pay close attention. What you're about to see is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you news as it relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Yisrael Hawkins. Well, we have diseases that are out of control, of course, uh, people fleeing for their lives, seeking peace and safety, and children, the innocent tragic victims of these atrocities. And of course, world leaders are finally admitting there is no solution to any of these problems. Well, all of this and more in today's broadcast, but we start off today with a rundown of diseases our global society has been facing. Gastroschisis, the birth defect that causes infants' intestines to protrude from the baby's abdomen, has been on the rise in the U.S. The CDC is warning about the rise in ticks, a little bug that is also responsible for spreading Lyme disease in almost half of the counties in the United States. That's right. And the Centers for Disease Control is also warning about a salmonella outbreak that has led to hundreds of people becoming sick. The CDC, CDC says this latest outbreak may be linked to people raising and consuming their own chickens in their backyards. Mm. Well, red alerts have been sounded in the states across the country due to a newer virus taking hold, and this time it's not Ebola. Instead, it's a rare virus called human enterovirus 68. Now, with the flu season coming into full swing, experts are saying this season is going to be a bad one. But some new and potent vaccines are on the market that might help, although I think it's a little interesting that they already know what the flu season is going to be like. How do you figure that in? And have a vaccine ahead of time. Interesting. Edible pot, weed, marijuana. The CDC is warning against the consumable after a teen jumped to his death off a bridge recently after consuming the drugs. Now they're eating it. Uh, to no end will they go. Well, new warnings or questions are arising asking if the same antibiotics that doctors are prescribing are actually causing superbugs. Mm. And don't forget the kissing bugs are on the rise and they are potentially deadly. Yeah, we talked about that a little not too long ago, a few broadcasts behind, back. Uh, a rare and potentially deadly lung disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is on the rise in the U.S. And doctors are scrambling to come up with an effective treatment for this little understood condition. 
Federal health officials have reported that three common sexually transmitted diseases are on the rise. Now, the leaps are due in part, some say, to reduce the funding for public health clinics. Hmm. Now, with over 1.4 million cases of chlamydia and 350,000 cases of gonorrhea reported to the CDC. Now, syphilis saw a 15% increase since 2013. Now, also an increase in newborn cases of syphilis since that same year, 2013. Sure, and those are just the cases that are actually reported, reported. to the CDC. That's right. Well, the CDC said that although reduced federal funding has led to the closure of some clinics, others have cut operating hours or increased cost on patients. Data from 2014 is the first time in which all three of those diseases that we just mentioned show noticeable increases. In case you're wondering, oral cancers are on the rise. Dr. Amanda Canto, a cosmetic dentist, stated that the leading cause in the rise of oral cancers are linked to the HPV virus, mm. a commonly sexually transmitted virus. Now, she also stated that it is now found that no longer are 40% of oral cancers attributed to smoking and alcohol use, although those are still the contributing factors, but most of it now they're saying is from this HPV, HPV. virus. That's right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Makes sense. A new study estimates that between 16 and 69 million Americans are infected with oral HPV, which, of course, raises their risk of cancers of the mouth. Dr. Philip Andrews, an otolaryngologist, uh, said that cancers of the mouth are largely caused by HPV, and these are mostly cancers of the tonsils or the base of the tongue, which is really far back in the uh, mouth where you can't actually see the cancer taking place. Well, over to Europe now. The UN has released the, that the numbers of refugees that have fled the countries into Greece have topped half a million. Melissa Fleming, the chief spokes, uh, spokesperson of the UNHCR, said at a press conference that the arrival of 8,000 people into Greece recently brought the total number of ref refugees entering the country to 502 thousand five hundred yeah, over half a million yeah, that's that's quite a handful there fleming's also mentioned that with this increased number there has also been an increase in deaths of asylum seekers and their travels to europe and at least three thousand one hundred uh, have died crossing the mediterranean into the continent and also she was uh, mentioning the the increased urgency for european countries to come together to try to do better to accommodate those asylum seekers as well well, 11 people lost their lives off the coast of Turkey, and shortly after, about 24 more died, bringing the total to 35 refugees who've drowned. Now, the refugees were trying to cross the Aegean Sea to Lesbos when their boat capsized. And in another incident, the bodies of about 24 people were recovered as their boat sank trying to cross the Black Sea close to Istanbul. About 50 migrants from Afghanistan and Syria were on board, along with the Turkish captain. So far, only seven have been rescued, while dozens more are still missing. A large rescue mission is underway. On Christmas Island, another rescue op operation is underway where it's thought that 25 asylum seekers have lost their lives. Witnesses said that all they could do is watch as the boat broke up as it was tossed about in the sea and it was nothing, there was nothing at all that they could do to help the men, women and children who were on board. Yeah. It's just uh, the sea going back and forth in their boat and, you know, the, just the, a feeling of helplessness and despair absolutely. with the uh, onlookers. Well, take a look at some of the images that were recovered showing the turmoil of the boats and the bodies that washed ashore as a result of the boats subsequently sinking. Uh, some of the in images that you're about to see may be disturbing to some viewers. Well, tens of thousands are also fleeing from the North African coast. Many are Syrian refugees, and others are from the Sub-Sahara Africa. 
as they try to cross, they are also they also need to be rescued. Now, four boats and 1,200 refugees in just six hours. They rescued 1,200 in six hours. Now, the task is immense for those watching the waters, where thousands are trying to flee in search of a better life for themselves and their families. That's right. Well, close to 70,000 have been saved by rescue boats in 2015 alone. One young woman fleeing with her family of 13 others said the smugglers left us and ran away and no one knew how to drive the boat. Everyone said something different. We tried to get closer to every ship we saw from afar. Now, she, con she continued, we are in trouble. We are lost. We will never get to our destination. Now, many are exhausted, sick and hungry. Parents live in fear for the safety of their children. One man, a father, said, on the boat, I thought maybe it is the last time I can hold and kiss my son. Maybe this is the last time I can kiss his face. Hmm. Now, the stress of these monumental trips are, of course, stressful for all. Another man, a father and husband, said, I hope that my children will never again see things like this, and I hope they will forgive me for the terror they experienced on this trip. I hope my children and my wife will forgive me. For those refugees who survived the peril at sea, the difficulties for them are not yet over. Now they must try to make a new life in a new place. That's right. Well, continuing our coverage on the crisis in the Euphrates region, our correspondent Larry McGee has the story on grieving parents, gas attacks, and turmoil in Syria. Larry, what do you have for us? For those fleeing the terrors of the Tigris and Euphrates region, danger, horror, and mourning have become an inescapable part of everyday life. Men such as Ahmed have been saddled with the grief of having to bury a wife, two children, and in his case, also the shock and pain of finding his only remaining child severely burned and bandaged from a bombing and barely clinging to life in a local hospital. So far, the conquest of Syria has driven 11 million people from their homes. Ahmed lived in a town just outside of Damascus, which is reportedly in the hands of mercenary forces and has therefore been a consistent target of the Syrian government. With the bloodshed and carnage of the Syrian insurrection continuing to mount and ever more devastating weapons of torture and murder being employed, veteran journalists such as CBS's Scott Pelley are departing from the industry practice post-Vietnam of refraining from explicit and graphic imagery during wartime. In an interview concerning his choice to display graphic and uncensored images of a sarin gas attack in Syria, Pelley stated that the attack killed more than a thousand people, more than four hundred of which were children. The veteran reporter said you can read about that all day, but if you don't see it, he doesn't believe the impact truly hits you. The chemical attack was carried out in Damascus and U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is calling on the Syrian government to allow U.N. chemical weapons experts to visit the site of the attack and investigate the incident. Representatives from both the U.S. and Russia agree that an objective investigation needs to be conducted, but President Assad is denying any involvement in the incident. Meanwhile, the plight of the refugees attempting to flee the turmoil is continuing to grab international headlines as various news agencies attempt to detail the hardships of those running from Syria to other nations in hopes for peace. Some are settling in Lebanon in the Valley of Becca, for example, as winter storms and cold temperatures are gripping the region. Over the last four years, more than one million Syrians have relocated to Lebanon, which only has a total population population of 4 million people. Refugee camp conditions are heartbreaking with water leaks, collapsed structures, and parents who nightly fear the possibility of losing children to hypothermia. UN aid to the refugees is reported to be only 60% adequate with respect to basic needs. The task of coordinating and distributing aid is the responsibility of local governments, but they are having more than a difficult time attempting to keep up with the influx. Non governmental organizations have attempted to make up for the shortfall, but even with their assistance, aid overall has still been insufficient. Personal accounts provided by refugees speak not just of being unable to secure supplies, but also of refugees being beaten with sticks and women having their headscarves removed to humiliate them. 
the plea and cry from Syrian refugees to reporters and the world is that they are dying from hunger, cold, and humiliation. For YPN News, I'm Larry McGee. Katan Jeff, back to you. Well, it looks like, Katan, they're getting a little bit of relief, Mm -hmm. but definitely not enough and too late and not enough for everybody. That's right. Well, for those in Gaza and the West Bank, the long siege continues to take its toll. Beginning in 2007, Israel started a blockade against the Palestinian territories, shutting them in and cutting them off from the basic commodities of life. Zohar al-Najif, a news media translator separated from his wife and two children, can only listen to their crying over the phone. But as explosions go on in the background, he can barely hear them. That's right. In a voice filled with despair and disbelief, he told Channel 4 TV, Last night my daughter told me, tell me I'm not going to die. Six-year-old girl asking her father not to die. Well, to not die. The, the next day he learned that 17 people from the same area uh, his family lives in were killed by renewed shelling and some ground fighting. Well, his family did survive uh, that uh, occurrence, and he is helpless to save them from the terror that's all around them. Now, visiting al Shafara Hospital in Gaza City, where the injured are taken, shows the stark reality of Israelis' onslaught against the Palestinians. Now, clearly, it is the children who are suffering the most. Two-and-a-half-year-old Naama was caught in the missile attack or caught in a missile attack from an F-16. Now, still in shock, the young girl suffers with a broken nose and fractured skull. Hmm. Seven-year-old Noradin was also grievously injured from an F-16 missile attack where 45 others were injured and two were killed. Downstairs in the emergency ward, 10-year-old Ahmad brought in with head injuries front and back. 20 other children were wounded in the same attack. Now, the director of the emergency ward, Dr. Ayman al Shahabanabi, pleaded with those outside the community to reporters saying, innocent people. All that which we receive here are innocent people. It's all of them civilians. Mm, He asked why and for how long? For how long? It's enough, he says. And he continues, I propose immediately a ceasefire for now to save the innocent people. They are human beings. Where's the rights of human rights? Now, outside his office, grieving fathers were weeping. You know, you can tell the frustration in his voice, uh, Mm -hmm. having to treat all these civilians, uh, knowing that there's just, you know, there's no positive outcome to these wars, only suffering. And the the fighting that's going on between leaders and nations and armies, well, they're not the ones coming into the hospitals, it's the civilians, the non-combatants. While the fighting in Fallujah, Iraq, ceased five years ago, it is still a lethal place, especially for newborns. Mm -hmm. Now, in recent months, it is estimated that as many as 25% of infants have been born with serious abnormalities. The hospital in Fallujah alone is now dealing with around seven cases of neurotube defects on a weekly basis. Also alarming are the high numbers of babies being born with tumors and other mutations, which the staff had never seen before the 2003 U.S. invasion. Now, one report says there is strong evidence to uh, the cause of this is the disturbing trends of the toxic fallout from the United States weapons, including heavy metal nanoparticles and depleted uranium, among other chemicals, which are proven to cause cancer and birth defects. Now, as we mentioned, with so much fighting and devastation going on, hundreds of thousands of refugees have fled their war-torn countries in the Middle East and Africa in search of a better, safer life in Europe. But they have been met with the stark reality that the Europe that they finally made it to is much different than the one they had pictured in their minds before they made their their uh, treacherous journey. Right, I bet. Well, it's an especially dangerous place for children. The EU's criminal intelligence agency announced that at least 10,000 unaccompanied child refugees have gone missing after arriving in Europe. Some 5,000 children have disappeared in Italy alone, and these numbers are only estimates and likely to be much higher. Europool said it as evidence that some of the unaccompanied child refugees have been sexually exploited. However, some of the children do not even reach Europe. 
Now, just recently, and as uh, similar to our earlier story, 40 people drowned, including 10 children, after their boat sank in the Aegean Sea. The migrants were trying to reach Greece, crossing from Turkey. Now, the Turkish Coast Guard found some of the victims to be as young as one and two years old. Oh, that's very sad. But those who have managed to reach their destination safely will have to face the increasing anti-refugee sentiment that has been spreading steadily across the European continent over the past year. Anti-refugee protests are taking place throughout Europe. The protesters are demanding the European Union change its policy towards the asylum seekers. In the British city of Dover, fighting broke out between opponents and supporters of the refugees. It was a confusing sight as British police were, st were stuck in the middle. They made arrests on both sides. Even more threatening than the protesters, however, was a mob of masked men dressed in black. Hmm. Uh, they went on a rampage in the streets of Stockholm, Sweden. Their goal to single out and attack ch children refugees from North Africa. Well, prior to the attack, the group distributed leaflets threatening to give the asylum seekers, quote, the punishment they deserve. Wow. wow. Katan, it's, it's, it's very evident that the plight of these refugees is becoming a, a desperate situation. Right. Now, parents who thought they were saving their children have to deal with the cold, hard facts that the Europe they risk their lives for is not offering them any hope. One woman told reporters, we are so scared for our kids as she sobbed on her husband's shoulder while he cradled their five-month-old baby. That's right. While torrential rain pours down, there is little to no shelter, no refugee camps being set up, and no one coming to offer help. Many countries are becoming overwhelmed by the number of migrants seeking asylum. Uh, another refugee, refugee, excuse me, Ibrahim al-Masri, pulls his daughter off his shoulders, telling journalists, look at this girl. In Syria, she was an angel. Now she is homeless and treated like an animal. She is feverish and listless, he cries. With no clear solution, places like Macedonia declared a state of emergency, temporarily shutting down its border. Now, this left many refugees feeling abandoned. A gentle, comforting touch is often all a parent can offer their child in such a hopeless situation. Few people thought they would be degraded to this degree. Mm, wow. Well, at one point, uh, panic swelled along the border. Young men threw themselves across while other refugees decided to make a run for it, bolting through any opening they could find, then darting across fields. Macedonian police came against the refugees with batons and even fired at them. Some families were separated in the chaos. One woman who got her son across but was pushed back herself cried over her son. He is gone. I don't know. I can't see him. But she's not alone in her heart-wrenching agony. Now, there were hardships. There were hardships, of course, as they left. They thought that they were going to end once they reached Europe. Mm -hmm. But instead, along the border are many echoes of misery too profound to comprehend. So they're just met with this uh, uncertainty. Uh, nobody wants to accept them anymore. They're just the, the, the countries are overwhelmed. They don't know what to do. These people had a great life where they were. But the wars have caused them to flee their countries and now uh, families despair. are also being broken up in the process. So once they were a whole, now they're just pieces of a whole. Very sad situation. Well, in the light of technology today, the brutality of war cannot be hidden from society. Photos of children killed in the current Syrian fighting surface daily. Their lifeless bodies are left horrifically maimed and mangled. There is no doubt the cost of war in Syria is the very lives of its future generations. We must warn you that what you're about to see is extremely graphic. Absolutely terrible. It sure is. While so many Syrians are being forced to flee their homes, taking their children with them to save them from the fighting, some are making seemingly insensitive comments on social media. UK columnist Katie Hopkins made one such tweet that triggered an uproar online after she wrote, Stand by for more pics of dead kids. Hmm. 
Well, RT interviewed Ms. Hopkins to find out just what she meant by that horrifying statement. She explained, what I'm trying to say when I say stand by for more pics of dead kids really is that we see it now on a regular basis. Uh, just today, actually, 27 in- individuals died trying to cross the med. Uh, and I really, I think really we've had a year of this now where we've done nothing. And she said, there is no solution being presented. So, you know, as people continue to stand by and watch all these people trying to flee uh, a dangerous situation, and many of them are dying in the process, there's nothing that's actually being done or a solution being presented to help these innocent victims of war. Well, Ms. Hopkins is right. There is no solution being presented from our world leaders to end these wars. Everywhere we turn in the Middle East, from Gaza to Iraq to Syria, the people are suffering from hatred and extreme violence. The future of the families and children from these war-torn countries is bleak at best. Well, gaining recognition daily, Yisra Hawkins, promoter of the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program and overseer of the House Yahweh, has dedicated his life to helping others. Believe it or not, he is the only one offering a real and obtainable solution to the conflicts raging in the world at this time. Check out his work for yourself by contacting the House of Yahweh today. And when you contact the House of Yahweh, don't forget to request your free copy of the monthly newsletter and Prophetic Word magazine. To contact the House of Yahweh, you can write them at the House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas, 79604. You can also call them at 1-800-613-9494. Or you can visit them on any of their websites at www.yahweh.com, www.yishrohawkins.com, and www.yahwehsbranch.com. Or don't forget to visit our new website at www. Dot ypnnews.com. You can also email them at info at yahweh.com. And for any calls outside the United States, don't forget to call the number on your screen as well. Don't forget about the latest and greatest study tool on the market today, the Yisrael Says program. And you can find that at www.yisraelsays.com. Well, don't go anywhere. Up next is another enlightening message from Yeshua Hawkins. For all of us here at YPN News, I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. And I'm Katana Alexander. Thanks for watching. Please remember that the the brief moments you've seen of the dead children, the dead people, the suffering, it's all due to the ignoring of Yahweh's laws and the giving to sin, the not keeping the agreements that we make with Yahweh. At this time, I'd like to present Yahweh's anointed Seventh-day Malik, the greatest teacher in the world, the great Kahan Yezreel, Abel Hawkins. Shalom, everyone. (laughs) You may be seated. (laughs) <laughs> you may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. The news media is saying if you can see it, and of course, uh, Yahweh has made it possible for you to see, and it hasn't come near you yet. <laughs> Read Psalms 91, or keep it in mind. Don't read it now. We got other things to cover. Uh, the this is all breaking news right now, and I've got uh, Elia going through it. Uh, Kohan uh, Elia Hyler Hawkins going through it, but I want to go on to other things. We got we're uh, we're growing in. Uh, in uh, readers, in, in uh, I guess in popularity, uh, I'll, show, <laughs> I'll show you the one, the one thing, the house of Yahweh is still at the top. <laughs> uh, I would I could read you all of that right now, but I don't, I really don't have time. So I want to read you the bread sack for sure. 
um, um, it's hard to see that mess that's going on into the world and, and not get shook up. This way, as the news announcer says, you know, you get, it's, it becomes real when you can see it. When you just hear about it, it's, uh, it means nothing to you. And, of course, being protected here by Yahweh, this should start meaning more and more to you. I told you the United States is going to remain strong. The only reason it's going to remain strong is so this message of Yahweh can get out. You know, <laughs> if, uh, if they could stop us with nuclear bombs, they would. The fact is, uh, they can't until, this, uh, until Yahweh's plan is completed. It is great. This is the bread sack. Look in the prophetic word for it. Other things will be added to this, of course, uh, as we go. And, and the children's uh, portion of that magazine called uh, Just Kidding, uh, we're going to use some humor and show how stupid the world is and some of its uh, decisions. It's made from top officials, of course, and our children giving the answers and things like this, and this is going to be great. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. Uh, it is great Father Yahweh's purpose and goal to, to bring his uh, children to perfect righteousness. Uh, what an awesome plan. Help us, Father Yahweh, to desire your great plan and, and nothing less. Praise Yahweh. <laughs> Um, I'm encouraging, been encouraging the supervisors to, you know, uh, to bring our people to perfection. I said, if they're one minute late, that means they're not on time. If they're 10 seconds late, it means they're not there on time. Why not get there earlier so you won't be guilty, <laughs> won't be guilty of stealing Yahweh's time? that he has assigned you to do. You know, uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, alien from outer space, if you're in charge of them, they could do a lot of damage in one minute or 10 seconds if you're, uh, if you're assigned to a job that you've got to protect a certain planet or a billion or so beings that's out there working for Yahweh. Think of this. Be on time. If you say you're going to do something, do it and stick with it. Is there something wrong with that? No. <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you see the supervisors getting on to you pretty heavily, thank them for it and praise Yahweh for pointing it out to you because you've got to come to perfection. Uh, no longer, uh, no danger in nuclear war. Well, the Pentagon plans on blowing up the planet. <laughs> And that's, they're, they're get, they release some things here. Uh, the uh, news media did that, uh, that shows how, how close we are at this nuclear war. And, 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 of course, the scripture shows we are too. And then numbers that will be revealed next week. Not this week, not today, but next Sabbath, Yahweh willing. That's assuming I get through with my portion of it here today with the prophecies, and then the other will back it up. But uh, uh, you should be concerned, this article says, uh, military documents confirm that nuclear war is still on the drawing board of the Pentagon. Compared to the 1950s, however, today's nuclear weapons are far more advanced. The delivery system is more precise. In addition to China and Russia, Iran, Syria, and North Korea are targets for the first strike, preemptive nuclear attacks. Now this is coming from the Pentagon. Let us be under no illusions this Pentagon's plan to blow up the planet using advanced nuclear weapons is still on the books. Uh, war is good for business, he says. Good for business. <laughs> uh, spearheaded by defense contractors Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop uh, Grumman, 
Boeing, British uh, Aerospace, and so forth, uh, uh, it's big money. Political insanity, the use of nuclear weapons is uh, ca- is casually endorsed by presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, who believes that nuclear weapons are in- instruments of peacemaking. Her election campaign is financed by the U.S. military. Her election campaign is financed by the U.S. military. It's hard to believe. I mean, industrial complex which produces the world military defense. Meanwhile, scientists on, on contract to the Pentagon have endorsed the use of tactical nuclear weapons. These weapons, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find out more and more about them, but they're nuclear, and they've been using them ever since we put the nuclear baby out, too, by the way. That was what was used to blow up the, the building that housed, they said, nuclear arsenal on the bank of the great river Euphrates. And, of course, that uh, the nuclear baby stopped there, and later on we started adding newspaper reports that we now send out with the new nuclear baby to show that it did start. But according to this article, uh, these uh, tactical nuclear weapons, they are endorsed because they go off underground. They penetrate the earth, then they explode, They're one-third to six times greater than the bombs we used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, meanwhile, scientists on contract to the Pentagon have endorsed the use of tactical nuclear weapons, which are said to be harmless to the surrounding civilian population, because the explosion is underground. The tactical nuclears are bona fide thermonuclear weapons with an explosive capacity between one-third and six times a Hiroshima bomb. They have been cleared by battlefield use in the conventional war theater by the, by the U.S. Senate and, and their... And their use does not require the approval by the (laughs) commander-in-chief. They don't even, the president doesn't even have to endorse this thing now. The people at the highest levels of government who make decisions regarding the use of nuclear weapons haven't, uh, haven't the foggiest idea as to the implications of their actions. Um, There's a couple more things I want to... Today's list of targeted cities. Uh, The the policy of nuclear bombing of targeted cities is still on the drawing board of the Pentagon, while today's list of targets uh, remain classified cities in Russia, China and Middle East, North Korea, are on the target list. Associated Press report quoted Pentagon sources June 4, 2015, confirms that. One more short note here. I know I got it marked somewhere. Here it is. Uh, The Hiroshima... Uh, day 2003 meeting had set the stage for the for the uh, privatization of nuclear war. Corporations not only uh, reap multi-billion dollar profits from the production of nuclear bombs, they also have a direct voice in setting the agenda. <laughs> the private corporations now, they have the voice. And they don't need the president's approval. Setting the agenda regarding the use of deployment of nuclear weapons. All the safeguards of the Cold War era, 
which uh, 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 categorized the nuclear bomb as a weapon of last resort have been scrapped. Offensive military action using nuclear warheads are now described as acts of (laughs) self-defense. Uh, um, let's see, uh, uh, the one, uh, the one that was dropped on Hiroshima, I marked that date, August 6, uh, 1945. I was 11 years old when that took place. And of course the prophecy showed it would be developed in my lifetime. If you remember, if you keep up with the newsletters, I really believe that everyone needs to keep up with those news releases. Uh, they won't come out once a month. They're coming out every week. Uh, you could get on the proofreading list. Uh, we may have to start giving you used ones, but we'll get them to you if you want to get on the proofreading list. Vatican speaker on climate change, he says there are six billion too many of us. <laughs> uh, he wants to be one that's left alive, I'm sure, but... The others don't matter, as you can see. When you see soldiers beating children back with sticks and clubs to keep them from getting a handful of food, there's something wrong with the person's mind. You know, uh, I mean, this is not this is not human. They wouldn't even they'll feed dogs when they won't feed people. They will beat the people back and let the dogs have the food. HIV drug resistance on the rise, that goes along with your, with your confused minds. Researchers pinpoint how HIV hides and grows inside the body even when detectable in the blood. Remember Isaiah 65? Uh, uh, the abominable things is in the blood. In the blood. Well, of course, we're part of the house of Yahweh. And the house of Yahweh, Yahweh has allowed the house of Yahweh to be destroyed because the 12 tribes of Israel, whom he brought out of Egypt, rejected Yahweh's righteousness uh, that Yahweh said should bring, if practiced, healthy minds, healthy bodies and healthy minds. It will bring peace, he says, It will bring joy, which starts with Isaiah 58. Remember, I left off with that scripture last last, uh, Sabbath. And, and, uh, of course, it will bring eternal life. And all of this was rejected. Uh, We read Amos 3, where Yahweh shows that he brought the... Well, let's uh, let's turn there and read it uh, uh, fast. I won't elaborate on it, but it uh, uh, at least re- rehearse it in your mind. Amosha 3, found on page 696. Uh, he says, uh, uh, Hear this word which Yahweh has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth, Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities, that is, judge you for all your iniquities. You're on trial. I'm letting you go your way, and you're on trial, uh, uh, proving to heaven and earth exactly what your way will bring. There won't ever be this again. This, this, is, this is it once these trials are over. Can two walk together? Unless they are in agreement? <laughs> well, of course not. We see this in, in uh, Genesis. He points out the same thing. Now listen to me. He points out the same thing to Cain before he killed Abel. Before Cain killed Abel, he said to him, If you do righteousness, you will be acceptable. If you don't do righteousness, he says, sin lies at your door. Yes, not doing righteousness is sin. That sin is breaking Yahweh's laws of righteousness. Now that should be clear enough for anyone. None of the world is keeping Yahweh's laws of righteousness. The house of Yahweh only 
teaches his laws of righteousness. Well, he says, will a lion roar in the forest unless he has the prey? He's given you now scenarios here. And then he says, will a trumpet be blown in a city and the people not be afraid? Will iniquity flourish there? And religious imposters, will the Catholic Church be there? And Yahweh not have a work there also? Verse 7, Yahweh has seven prophesied works. And we are the seventh prophesied work. And there is no other. <laughs> Most assuredly, he says, Father Yahweh will have no work other than the work that he has prophesied in advance by his servants, the prophets. By his servants, the prophets. Now, what did they say? Yahshua said that the prophets prophesied up until Yalkanon. And he said, he said, since that time, Yahshua becomes our high priest, and that's where we receive guidance and word. He's our high priest. The high priest were guiding the Pharisees, but the high priest had turned to evil. They would not accept Yahweh's laws. So Yahweh gave them up to a reprobate mind, and that's what you're seeing in, these new, in this news right now. You're not seeing sanity at all on, on the news. You're, see, you're seeing everything out there look so crazy, it's almost unbelievable. It's like the news announcer said, you know, hearing it, you really don't believe it. But seeing it this way, and Yahweh said, you're going to see it. When he said that, there wasn't a television invented at the time. That came with the knowledge increase that Daniel prophesied for this time period when he saw the two witnesses. Yeah, yeah. you see all of this and Yahweh prophesying it and it all coming to pass, just falling into place, uh, one, one after another. Now go over to Revelations. This is, I think, where I left off. Uh, last week, uh, Revelation 16, and we were talking about the wars here and who would bring them about. You saw what's going on. You've been seeing it every week here. But Revelation 16, please, everyone get this and read with me. It's very important that you read every word of this right here with me and listen to what I say about it. Revelations, the 16th chapter, and verse 12. He says, And the sixth Moloch poured out his bowl. This is a, it's not a, it, 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 the, the, his voice and the words that is being brought forth in this particular time period by the seventh Moloch. He brings this all about, as shown in verse 10. He's the one that brings this. Verse 10, all these secrets. What's the secret? Seals. Remember? Seals. Seals. You remember the seals. Remember Daniel 12? Yahweh said, seal, seal these things. Okay, now the prophets prophesied these things. Daniel was one of the prophets. Remember him? They prof he prophesied these seals. Yahweh said, seal up the book. Now, for 1,500 years, no one could even look at the book of Yahweh. They were sealed. But now we have a Savior. The, the prophet spoke up until Yahshua Messiah. I don't know what idiot could look at the history today and not see that Yahshua Messiah changed the whole world with his Birth and his death, it changed everything. And, and Yahshua right now is leading his house, which he says the gates of hell won't prevail against. How did they prevail against? By deception. Not believing what the prophets had spoken, not believing the one sent, the prophet sent, who also Yahweh made put in writing 
for the people so we could read it from then on and then on and then on. Throughout all eternity, this book of Yahweh is going to guide the universe. Yes. And it was written by the prophets up until the time of the Savior. We'll see that in Scripture in just a moment. But I want to tell you in advance how this took place. After Yahshua was born, he was prophesied to die. Then he was prophesied to take his seat it, by the side of Yahweh in heaven, that was written in the Psalms. No one believed it, but it was written there. That's where he sits right now, whether you believe it or not. And he's judging you for whatever you're doing now. For being one minute late, for breaking your vows, for taking the name Hawkins off of your name. <laughs> No, don't be associated with the zealous priest of Yahweh. I'm going to tell you your sins. <laughs> don't, don't have anything to do with him. That's what Satan is telling you to do. And if, you're, if Satan is your leader, whatever she tells you to do, that's what Yahshua said you're going to do. You don't have to. You could repent, beg for forgiveness, and Yahshua will start leading you again. But that's the only way. 16. Re Revelation 16 now. We're in this time period right here. This is, this is what is taking place right here. Upon the great river Euphrates, that's where, if you, if you look, that's where all the trouble is. How could he possibly know that's where the trouble was going to be? This thing was written in 96 A.C.E. <laughs> This is 2016. How could he possibly know is that there's the tour of the trouble is going to be right there? And he pinpoints it here. And he poured it on the great river Euphrates. He's pouring out from his mouth telling you what is going to take place in that fourth part of the earth. In that fourth part of the earth is what you just saw on the news. Children starving. Over a hundred million people without a home. Forced out of their houses. Bombs dropped on them. They're begging for food and being beaten with sticks. And no one wants to help them. Would you give a child something to eat if he was asking for it? How could you possibly, how could a per person in their right mind possibly say no to something like this? But how could they be bombing these places in their right mind and putting these people in this array that he's fixing to show you right here now, if you'll just listen to me really closely? The river was dried up. Dried up so that the way, the way, what is he talking about here? The way of the kings. The kings there are religions, religions of the east. The religions of the east might be prepared. Well, who's preparing them? Have you watched the news to see who's visiting them and telling them you've got to do this or that? His name is Francis. <laughs> and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophets. Uh, for they are the spirits of demons. You get that? You see that? Remember, verse chapter nine says, and they still won't repent of this demon worship, devil worship. They still won't repent of that. Next week, you're going to find out from other, other sources what I'm talking about here. From next Sabbath, you'll find this out. It's so beautiful what Yahweh hides for his house to only to bring out. Spirits of demons who perform, who perform signs. There was one on the news directly Directly under me, they said he's a miracle worker. Obama. It's not Obama now, but Obama is attention seeker. Um, 
His audience is big on the Bible. Uh, he's a, he, he reveals, uh, see, uh, uh, revealed on OBTV channel that he has a supernatural power with which he, and that's the end of it, a supernatural power. You know, the Egyptians had that too. When, when Moshe <laughs> led the 12 tribes out of there, well, they had this, these uh, people with supernatural powers. And, uh, and of course, they had big followings. In the days of Eliyah, you remember him? He was the only priest of Yahweh, and, and, and Baal had 450 of these supernatural power people out there, roaming the countryside, getting a big audience, too. Well, uh, we stopped at verse 14, spirits of demons now, and he tells you what they are who perform signs and go forth to the kings of the earth, the kings of the earth, the religions of the earth, um, the Vatican just sent 1,142 of the super, super confessors. You call 1,142 super confessors to the religions of the earth because he can't ta- he can't go himself, and only the Pope can do this. Only the Pope can take their confessions because they they gave some things that you can't be forgiven for except by the Pope himself. One of them was spitting out the Eucharist. (laughs) Nothing was refusing to take it, I think. Nothing was asking, well, what do you have in this? (laughs) There's some things that just too bad, too big a sin to be forgiven. But now these 1,142 that he's just sent out now last week is going out to the religions of the earth. The religions of the earth. Okay, for they are spirits of demons who perform signs and go forth to the religions of the whole inhabited earth to gather them to battle. Gather them to battle? This is a religious... This, these are religions, and they're gathering them to battle, <laughs> to war. They're going to tell you they're gathering them to peace while they wipe out four-fifths of the earth's population of that great day of Yahweh. Behold, I, c- I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. This garment is righteousness, white robes. Remember, garments, I give to you garments, white robes, meaning perfect righteousness. He's given it here today, right here in his house, (laughs) saying, keep my laws and you will have all of this. This is what he said to Israel, but not having a true abiding, living, righteous priest who says, don't be a minute late, be on time or be early, one of the two, but don't be late. That's what Yahshua said. That's what Yahweh said to Cain. Where have you been? Uh, I got stayed up too late last night and drank too, one too many beers. Well, is this show on television that I just had to watch. I got hooked on it and I couldn't turn that thing off. What excuse did Cain have? Well, here he's saying, watch and keep yourself perfectly righteous. That's what he's telling you. That's what I'm telling you right now. <laughs> keep yourselves righteous or he will, or, or he will walk naked. Now, this should conjure up in your mind quickly back to Genesis. The beginning, naked. They knew that they were naked and they were ashamed. Which we've shown you, they, this means they wanted to wipe that out. They didn't want to say they're sinning because they don't, they don't want to admit there was any law. And sin is the breaking of the law. So they put naked. Well, it's the same wording right here in Revelations. Naked, they were naked 
Adam and Eve knew that they were naked. Wow. That would take a lot to learn that. They must have had to went to college for four years at least to know that they were naked. And people believe that crap. <laughs> it's it, 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 well, I better not. <laughs> well, of course, they knew that they were sinned, that they had sinned. Watch your garments. Don't let sin enter in so you won't be ashamed. You see that? So you will not be ashamed. Write that down. Write Genesis 3, I think it's 8, about 8 through 11 or something there. Write it down because we don't have a footnote on it where it'll remind you to go back there and see what they're talking about here. He's talking about real people here, and he's talking about something that really took place. In, in verse, back to verse 12, the people in this is one-fourth part of the earth. This is the people in one-fourth part of the earth. And we see here that, the, that these people are dried up. This word here, the Hebrew word, that this comes from. It means, uh, the, the, the people, of course, means waters, as you, as is pointed out to you in Revelation 17, I think about verse 15, uh, that, which is the very next chapter. We're in chapter 16 now, in verse 12. The waters, the people, the people, get this, the people are dried up. Well, the word's dried up. What could that possibly mean? The people, it means discomfited. It means uh, to frustrate, uh, to uh, disconcert. These are the meanings of the Hebrew word. Uh, disconcert means to upset or embarrass, put to shame. Uh, all impediments, it says, removed. All impediments removed from what? The impediments. They're removing. And this, this person, the agency that deceived Eve and led Adam into sin and Cain, one of the ruthless leaders, like Nimrod, like the Nimrod system, that's what he followed, They have impediments in their way right now because the people do not want to. And the Pope, if you remember, he went and visited these people. And Russia says, don't mess with our religion. And then they made the boast, if you're a bearer, you don't need to ask permission. You can do what you want to do if you're a grizzly. Malachi Martin was talking about this, uh, these impediments to the Catholic Church when he said Russia could turn out to be a grizzly overnight, meaning she is going to reject what the Vatican has to offer here. Are you getting the picture now? Is that coming plain? There's impediments in the way, and what you're seeing here. According to this one Hebrew word, drying up the people, drying up the water, frustrating them, uh, discomfited, to, to frustrate, to disconcert, to upset, to embarrass. They're pretty embarrassed right now, you could tell this. The people are fighting for their lives. They're begging for food. They're begging for shelter. They're just begging for a place to live. Our forefathers, when this same thing was going on, that actually built the great Roman Empire, this huge Roman Empire that took over the earth, made up of four religions, and a spokesman, a spokesman, they called him Pope. Before that, they called him rabbis. Before that, they called him pharaohs. But they came from Egypt and they went back to Egypt, your scripture says. <laughs> even a Christian should, should get these things. They, they, even a Christian should be able to understand that only this 
12 tribes is what Yahweh was dealing with and still dealing with today. Now, all the earth here has been told you've got to do a certain thing. But these people are impeding the Pope in what he's wanting to do. Not the Pope. He's the Santa Claus that goes out and delivers the message saying the Vatican can do this to you if you don't do this. And Russia is saying, don't mess with our religion. <laughs> well, he's just one, China, that, that was named also, that they were going to, that uh, the Queen of Heaven, <laughs> the Queen of Heaven, Mary, as they call the Queen of Heaven, the goddess Isis, she's making war. Well, they think Isis is on the side of the Catholic Church. The Muslims think Isis is on their side. Each one thinks ISIS is going to let them win. ISIS is preparing the whole world here, brother, for destruction. And that is what it's talking about. But it starts in and around the great river Euphrates here. And the people are brought to shame. They have come to nothing. They have no homes. They have no shelter, no food. <laughs> Not just a family or two, we're talking about millions of people. Over, the last count I had was over a hundred million people, and it's climbing every day. With that in your mind, turn back to Revelations 13. Now, here is what's being impeded the United States is number one in this. As we saw in chapter 6, many times, with the Catholic Church in the lead, and then the United States is given authority to take peace from the earth. Let's go back there again and read that. Chapter 6 of Revelations. You can understand this if you'll just read it. If you'll just read this, you can understand it if you'll read and listen to what I'm saying. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. These were the seals that was prophesied to Daniel. Seal this up. It's not going to be given until the time of the end. That's what Daniel was told to do, and that's what he did, and that's what he wrote. Seal it until the time of the end. Well, here is Yahshua, the Lamb, who the Catholic Church is fighting against. That's Revelations now, 17, verse 10, that that this beast will make war with the lamb. How? By telling you not to follow the scriptures. <laughs> not to follow them old written rules. That was written, he, he, the Pope says, the Vatican said it, the Pope just read it. I don't think the Pope has sense enough to write a sermon on his own. If, if the Pope were reading to try reading the scriptures to try to write a sermon, he would notice these things that I say are true and correct. Now, he denies them and, and makes slurring remarks against the man who knows it all, as he put it, when they say they know it all. <laughs> well, I can say that because my high priest, Yahshua Messiah, does, and Yahweh does. <laughs> Well, here now he says, uh, chapter 6 and verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb, the Lamb, that's Yahshua Messiah, who sits, who died as a Lamb, who died as a Lamb, and, and uh, now sits at Yahweh's right hand because he was willing to give his life rather than break Yahweh's law. He gave his life freely for you. So you can imagine, you knowing that, how he feels when he sees you turn back to sin. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals that Daniel 12, 4, got that? One of the seals of Daniel's 12, 4. Because he shows that we're going to understand it at that time through two witnesses. And I looked and a future day of teaching, and I saw these two others. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. And I heard, as it were, one of the four 
the four. These are one of the four of the golden altar, one of the four horns of the golden altar that took so many billions of lives and still taking them and children and grown-ups begging. This is what this represents. Well, these are the horns in action, living creatures in action. Saying as with a voice like thunder, this is one pronouncing it, uh, reading it to you. Come and see. And I looked and, and, and behold a white horse. This is with a, a rider that's a religion. <laughs> These horns represent spokesmen. Out of their mouth comes their orders to give the power to kill. They also represent the horns of a wild beast who uses it for goring, for killing. One of these horns. Okay, verse, verse 2. And I looked and behold a white horse, and who who sat upon it had a bow. This is something to kill people with. It's army, it's military. It was then. It's tactical, tactical nuclear weapons now, which will turn into... The other, they will use them in a, in a first strike, and they have them ready, too. And a crown, that means authority. Authority for what? <laughs> authority to make war. As we see in the next chapter we're going to go into, authority to make war was given unto him, and he went out making war. Authority was given unto him. Well, who is this him? That is speaking of here. And when he had opened the second seal, that is, he reveals who it is. This is revealed in the second seal. And I heard the second creature come and say, come and see. And there and, and, and there went out another horse that was red, and power was granted to him who set upon it to take, take peace from the earth. And that they should kill one another. What's going on in and around the great river Euphrates? Now he said that's where it's going to be. That's where it's going to start. Well he's given. It is given unto him to cause this. To take peace from the earth. And saying unto them they should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. <laughs> great nuclear bombs is what it's speaking of here. Great military. A great, great military with great bombs that can destroy. We're in, uh, this is chapter 6. Now let's go back to Revelations here. Re uh, I mean, Revelations 13. Revelations 13. And remember, it's being impeded, so they've got to start wars here. They've got to dry this river up, these waters up. <laughs> they got to destroy these people, get them out of their homes where they can't do anything to fight back, where they can't be organized in any way. There's no organization here at all. They could be wiped out and starved to death or whatever. And they know it. And this is what the plan was to do here, as is shown in chapter 16, verse 12, that I just read you. Well, here in 13 now, Revelations 13, and look at verse 12. He says, and he, he exercised, well, let's go back to the, uh, verse 11. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns. Now, this is two religions, and that's what we are in the United States, two main religions, Catholic and what they call Protestant, horns like a lamb, uh, but he spoke as a dragon, which is what the United States does right now. They speak as the powerful one, and of course, I told you before, they're going to be that way. They're the strongest nation on earth. That's where the house of Yahweh was established in the chief of the nations, and he speaks as a dragon. They speak as a dragon. They speak with authority. 
because they, they know they got the bombs to back them up. And he exercised all, of, all the authority of the first beast before him. The United States is exercising what was the original Roman Catholic Empire. The same thing she was exercising, so is the United States. And caused the earth and those who dwell therein to worship the first beast. Who is the first beast? We see that in Revelation 17, sitting on seven hills. This woman, this city, is the leader of these kings of the earth, religions of the earth. Now, the religions are bucking up against her right now. And that's the reason 1,142 super, super confessors were sent out. And they can forgive sins and pull them back. Their job is to pull them in, as we see now in Revelation 17, that they join the Catholic Church for one hour. <laughs> one hour. <laughs> they worship the first beast. This second beast is saying right now, let's be like the first beast. Worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, meaning he had a deadly wound. And he does great wonder so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That's what a nuclear bomb did on Hiroshima 1945. Hiroshima made fire come down from the sky. It exploded above the, above the city, comes down on the city, made fire come down in the sight of men. And that brought peace to the earth, right? And deceives those who dwell upon the earth by those acts of power which he had authority to do in the sight of the beast, saying to those who dwell on the earth now that they should make an, an, a likeness, they should make a likeness of the beast. This is not make an idol now. It means... The same thing as Yahweh put in Genesis 1.26, I will make man in my likeness. Well, he's saying, don't make yourselves in the likeness of Yahweh. You'll have to be righteous. You'll have to follow Yahweh's righteousness to do that. Make yourself in the image of the gods. It's more desirable. The corporations that build the bombs can make more billions of dollars this way. It brings in a lot of money. Any sin brings in a lot of money to the pharmaceuticals, to the, to the bomb builders, to the politicians who make the rules. Well, he's saying a likeness to the beast, which had the deadly wound and, and did live. Well, it was that deadly wound, if you remember, that freed up the book of Yahweh. We would not have the book of Yahweh today if that deadly wound that they cause themselves now, they actually caused this by they got tired of, bu of burying the bodies. They say it's taking too much time to bury these bodies. It's taking, we're having to dig all these graves by hand. So they let them lay and they caused the black death to spread on the earth. I think they're probably doing the same thing there now. There's too many people dying in too many places. And you're going to see the plagues increase, of course. But it won't come near you. Read Psalms 91. If, if you're true to Yahweh. And he had power to give life unto the likeness of the beast. That is to bring this thing about. They have authority to do this. They have uh, authority. He has authority to bring this about. And notice what he does now, that the likeness of the beast should, should both speak and cause, force. This word cause here, it actually means force. Force. Force has never worked, as I've said a thousand times. It's never worked before to bring peace. But that's the only thing they know how to do. That's what Cain used. And, he, and Yahweh told them then, you're going to have continual war. 
They say, well, if we're all Catholics. Well, no, the Catholics, the Catholics are what they're trying. They're divided and, and, and going asunder. And the Pope is trying, the Vatican is trying to win them over to the Vatican. The Catholic, the Coptic Catholics were the first. The Roman Catholics was the second, but they split and each group had a large following. Each man that split off had a large following. And you see the Orthodox in Russia, you see the Muslims in wherever they are and in several different places, they're all worshiping ISIS and they admit that. And several people have admitted it here lately. They cause that as many as would not worship the likeness of the beast should be killed. That's exactly what they got in mind, and that's what the newspaper reports are saying right now. They, they, they say there's, there's about 5 billion too many people. There's 6 billion too many people on the face of the earth, and Malachi Martin said, Mary is going to make war with all of these people who will not worship her. That was his words. And he says, and I think she's going to win. Well, of course, if you're, if you're listening to the sermons up on the newsletters, you will see that Yahweh is protecting his house. And we're telling the world that now, that Yahweh's house is the only protected place. Satan would have destroyed it already if she could. The fact is she can't. And she knows she can't. She can't destroy it this time. She's not going to prevail. Yahweh is going to bring you through. You. You. <laughs> you which are alive and remain are going to be given the power to resurrect those who died before you. This is all waiting you and it's coming pretty rapidly right now. These wars are, come, are, are getting ready to start right now. They're going to be proclaiming peace. If you, was there anything on that? There's two. Two? Read them right quick. Okay. Come on. <clears throat> Just keeping in mind with what pastor is bringing about these religions, given their authority over to the beast, a recent article comes out, Syrian ceasefire agreed, world powers announced nationwide cessation of hostilities. Well, it says major powers agreed on Friday to a cessation of hostilities in, uh, in Syria set to begin in a week and to provide rapid humanitarian assess, or assess to besiege Syrian towns but failed to secure a complete ceasefire or end a rushing bombing. Now, John Kerry, who's the U.S. Secretary of State, he acknowledged this, and it's, of course it's comments made only on paper, and he says, what we need is to see in the next few days are actions on the ground, in the field. He said, adding that without a political transition, speaking of the removal of Assad, remember that, it is not to achieve, it is not possible to achieve peace. Well, um, Sergei Lavrov, who is the Russian foreign minister's comment in return, said that Russia would not stop, notice would not stop air attacks in Syria, saying the secession of hostilities did not apply to Islamic State um, which is affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Now, keep in mind, Russia is saying they're going to continue to bomb the terrorists. Well, the United States and Russia, of course, the Allies said that few Russian strikes have targeted those groups, with the vast majority hitting Western-backed groups. Well, why are they trying to come to an agreement? Well, the next article, of course, is Pope Francis aims for Middle East peace as next diplomatic miracle as he hosts the Iranian president. And it says, after his coup in, in reviving relations between Washington and Havana, Cuba, Pope Francis has his sights on an even bigger goal, ending the interfaith savagery that is ripping apart the Middle East and sending millions of people fleeing for their lives. Of course, he wants them all following the divine serpent or the Vatican. And it says, ahead of Mr. Rahani's, which is the president of, of Iran, amongst his visit, to Rome, the ambassador to Rome from Tehran said that close ties between the Vatican and Iran were of the utmost importance. Then Mr. Lombardi, who is Frederica Lombardi, he is the Vatican chief spokesman, he said that Francis was ready and willing to intervene wherever possible to help address the violence in the Middle East, in particular the proxy wars being fought across the region between the Sunni Arab 
uh, Saudi Arabia and the Shia Iranians. The Pope is acutely aware of the grave conflicts in the Middle East, and he will use his moral authority, knows what he defines as moral authority and international standing, that's his control of international governments, to promote peace at every opportunity. Notice the in the religious savagery, which is to worship the divine serpent. So you have a meeting calling for peace between these world leaders, and then, of course, you have the Middle East uh, brought East and Western Christians together again. Now, remember, the Pope just met with his counterpart from show Russia. It. Show it. Oh, yeah, let me show it there. That would help a lot. <laughs> it's great to have someone here helping you be better, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> now, keep in mind, this is the Russian Orthodox leader. Keep in mind, a Pope has never been to Russia. That's why they met in Cuba. Russia has never allowed a Pope on their uh, country or on their territory. They've always uh, not allowed that. They spoke against that. And it's, uh, um, <laughs> it says the Pope and the Patriarch discuss how to collaborate to protect Christians beginning with the persecuted in the Middle East. Now, of course, this is Russian. This is Russian influence. This is the influence of Vladimir Putin. And he's trying to do it through through the Christian church, through the Christian organization. So there's more to come on this. There's a whole stack that I'm sure you're going to cover next week. But keep in mind, they hand their authority over to the beast um, to bring forth peace. Peace, peace, true peace. Thank you. The, uh, th this one right here, it, 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 it kind of says it all, just what I got through talking about. How the Middle East brought Eastern and Western Christianity to get together again. <laughs> Now, this is exactly what the prophecy shows there that I just got through reading you. They're wiping out each one of these impediments with the wars that they got going right now. And, and each one of them is going to be beat down, just like they're trying to beat down the, the uh, Palestinians. Uh, been trying to do this for years. Uh, they won't make them accept it, but they can wipe out. Now, they got them to where they can wipe them out. And, uh, and most of them that are being killed, you won't even know about. But we'll see enough of it to know that it's taking place. May Yahweh bless you, and I'll turn the services back to the next leader. I love you!